PNG embraces China's partnership as U.S. Vice President warns of debt diplomacy. U.S. announces intention to support naval base construction in Manus. And Mahathir Mohamed shares Malaysian digital experience. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Saturday's news. The battle lines for influence in the Indo-Pacific region look to have been drawn in Port Moresby today with the leaders of two of the world's most influential countries outlining their plans for this strategic region. On the one hand, you have China's Belt and Road Initiative and on the other, the United States of America's announcement for greater involvement in this region. Mary reports. The final session of the APEC CEO Summit concluded with the two superpowers, China and the United States, addressing business leaders. President Xi Jinping of China spoke of the development needs of the Indo-Pacific region, calling for nations to focus on its people as the cornerstone of development. One should not expect a particular model of development to fit all countries. Blindly copying the development model of others will only be counterproductive. So will be any attempt to impose one's own development model on others. Currently, China and the U.S. are caught in a trade war, with both countries introducing tariffs on both sides. America says this is in response to unfair practices by China over many years. We have great respect for President Xi and great respect for China. But, in the President's words, China has taken advantage of the United States for many, many years. And those days are over. As the President's added, China has tremendous barriers, they have tremendous tariffs, and as we all know, their country engages in quotas, forced technology transfers, intellectual property theft, industrial subsidies on an unprecedented scale. President Xi also explained China's Belt and Road Initiative. Developed five years ago, the BRI has been the blueprint for China's increasing engagement in this region, including here in Papua New Guinea. According to China's leader, the BRI was not in any way a plan to garner political control of developing countries through what was being described as debt traps. Let me make this clear. The BRI is an open platform for cooperation. It is guided by the principle of consultation and collaboration for shared benefits. It is not designed to serve any hidden geopolitical agenda. It is not targeted against anyone, and it does not exclude anyone. It is not an exclusive club that is closed to non-members, nor is it a trap as some people has labeled it. Rather, the BRI is a major and transparent initiative with which China shares opportunities and pursues common development with the rest of the world. With extravagant amounts of funding being provided by China to developing countries, many of them in this region, there have been concerns that this level of funding may land many countries in debt debt that many may not be able to repay later on, a point not lost on America's vice president. And so today, let me say with great respect to all the nations across this wider region and the world, do not accept foreign debt that could compromise your sovereignty. Protect your interests, preserve your independence, and just like America, always put your country first. Whilst this battle between China and the United States have implications for all economies, Vice President Pence has also assured economies that there is still room for close cooperation between the world's two superpowers. The difficulties that the United States and other nations face with Beijing have been well documented by our administration. China knows where we stand. But as President Trump has said, in his words, we want to strengthen the relationship between our two countries and improve the lives of our citizens. And as the President prepares to meet with President Xi at the G20 summit in Argentina, we believe the progress could be made 
progress could be made between our two nations, even as the United States remains in a strong position. Merbatulo, National MTV News. Australia, US and Japan have announced a trilateral partnership to increase digital connectivity and infrastructure investments in the Indo-Pacific region. The partnership follows the signing of an agreement on the 12th of November. The partnership seeks to increase the collaboration between countries in the Indo-Pacific region to ensure infrastructure projects are up to international standards and principles of development. The U.S. Vice President has made the biggest announcement this year in terms of Defence Corporation saying they will support Australia and Papua New Guinea build a naval base on Manos. Mike Pence said this as he warned countries not to get into debt and to put the interests of their countries first. The move is to counter China's growing influence in the region and to ease the anxiety of the U.S. and Australia. The U.S. Vice President arrived in Port Mosby, where he was met by Deputy Prime Minister Charles Abel, the U.S. Ambassador to PNG, Catherine Ebert Gray, and other government officials. Pence's presence in the country is historic for Papua New Guinea, especially at a time when Chinese influence in PNG is growing. After a brief appearance at the airport, the U.S. Vice President was driven straight to the CEO summit, where he announced the U.S.'s plans for the Indo-Pacific. The plans include stronger security and economic partnerships with its allies and the support to build a joint naval base in Lombrum. We're also forging new and renewed security partnerships as shown by our recent trilateral naval exercises with India and Japan. And today, it's my privilege to announce that the United States will partner with Papua New Guinea and Australia on their joint initiative at Lombrum Naval Base on Manus Island. This is the first time a U.S. Vice President is in Papua New Guinea, but he delivered a strong statement to counter what was said by the Chinese President. The, principle of consultation. They are not really serious in assisting. On Thursday, Manus Governor Charlie Benjamin said the PNG government should not enter into any bilateral agreements with the Australian yeah. government without first consulting the provincial government. I say Manus will not be used again by the government of Papua New Guinea and Australia to further pursue the interests of Australia without our government first engaging meaningfully with the people and government of Manus. Enough is enough. Yes, Manus is an integral part of Papua New Guinea. Yes, Lombrum and Seattle Bay or Harbour are national assets. But this, that does not give the right to the government, governments of Papua New Guinea and Australia to conduct the appearances to Manus as no people living there and no government of its own. We will not remain unhappy. We will not be used again to advance the national interest of Australia to have the presence of Navy. While the news of this military establishment is being denied by the PNG and Australian governments since September, Australia will be giving four new naval vessels to the Papua New Guinea Defence Force to be based in Lombrum over the next three years. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. As the U.S. Vice President prepared to deliver his scathing statement against China's debt diplomacy, the Australian Prime Minister chose a warmer approach. Scott Morrison, who arrived this morning in Port Moresby, called Papua New Guineans and Australians one talks and family when referring to the relationship Australia has with PNG. He added that Australia would be stepping up to the challenge.
Well, thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome. It's uh, great to be here in Port Moresby and I want to... Australia's Prime Minister was choosing his words carefully and while his message was for the rest of the global community, he placed particular emphasis on the closeness of the PNG people to Australia. Papua New Guinea is not just Australia's closest neighbour geographically. We're family. One talk. For years it seemed there was no viable option for another strong partner in the region. But when China appeared, its upward rise and rapid expansion driven by strong economic growth, Australia's anxiety grew with it. Stay still long enough and our Trade Minister will do a deal with you. <laughs> but Australia is putting on a brave face. Mr Morrison said Australia is stepping up to the challenge and will remain committed to a stable APEC region. In light of the trade tension between the US, China and Russia, Scott Morrison said trade protectionism is not the solution for the region. Tit-for-tat protectionism and threats of trade wars are in no one's interest economically and undermine the authority of the global and regional trading rules that benefit us all and importantly the people, the families who live in our economies and are supported by our economies. But it's a subject that will continue to be discussed well after APEC ends in PNG. Scott Waide, National MTV News. Malaysia's Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed has issued a strong warning at the APEC CEO summit in Port Moresby, saying bad technology related policies will widen the inequality gap. Dr. Mohammed told CEOs and world leaders that new technology should be accessible to national governments and not only large corporations and rich countries. His message comes as Papua New Guinea struggles with high data costs and the high cost of building ICT infrastructure. Against the backdrop of a trade war between the U.S. and China, Dr. Mohatir Mohammed has expressed concerns about how the future will turn out if new technology isn't made accessible and affordable. The Malaysian Prime Minister's statement comes as the US and China drive the rise of protectionist trade policies, each guarding their own and making decisions that affect the rest of the region. Dr. Mohammed had one strong message, and that was that technology should be accessible and affordable, and that it should be backed by beneficial policies that put people first. Affordability and accessibility are key drivers in the widespread adoption of new technology. Dr. Mohammed didn't mince words when he said that technology itself doesn't create exclusions and widening socio-economic gaps. He said bad policies do. We must learn from the experience of others about good and bad policies so we can avoid the bad, the bad ones. The Malaysian Prime Minister's message couldn't have come at a better time. Papua New Guinea's rapid uptake of mobile phones, increased use of social media and the fast yet erratic push towards digital inclusion of SMEs has left many in bureaucratic and political circles baffled as to how to manage digital inclusion. Malaysia's solution has remained in education and ongoing inclusion. The biggest challenge facing my, any country is to ensure that technology does not widen inequality. For this, understanding the technological base is important. Education is the answer especially knowledge of artificial intelligence and its application. For many Papua New Guineans, the country is still a long way from digital inclusion. The cost of data and smartphones is still out of reach for many in rural areas and digital inclusion will only come about when the costs come down and technology is made accessible. Scott Wyde, National MTV News. Yo, and National MTV News will continue with more updates from the APEC Leaders Summit after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. All 21 leaders are in Port Moresby for the APEC Leaders Summit tomorrow. The official APEC 2018 family photo was taken at the APEC House this afternoon. The U.S. Vice President was not present at the family. Adelaide Sirix Curry reports.
all 21 APEC leaders were in Port Moresby for the APEC CEO summit closing. The New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern arrived late for the family photo but was present for discussions. Straight after the family photo, the leaders met with ABEX CEO 2018, Izzy Kelly in Tarake, for discussions on the recommendations for ABEX. I had excellent insights into the issues of the issues in the moment on the APEC agenda, and as such, they are an integral aspect of the work of APEC as a whole. Also there to meet with APEC leaders were Pacific Island leaders, with the Samoan Prime Minister commenting on climate change issues in the Pacific. Competition has once again made our region a place of renewed interest and strategic importance. Climate change and disaster risk affects our people in a variety of ways, including increased severe weather events, scarcity of food and water, and displaced communities. Information and communication technologies are burgeoning, and with them issues relating to accessibility, cybersecurity, and cyber-enabled crime. Adelaide Xerox Kari National, MTV News. With the world's media in Port Moresby, there was bound to be some negative publicity. Here's one report from New Zealand's One News on the negative publicity of PNG hosting the 2018 APEC Leaders Summit. Minister is on her way to Papua New Guinea for the APEC summit. It's the first time the small nation has hosted the summit and it's raised eyebrows by buying a fleet of Maseratis for the event. Here's political reporter Jenna Lynch. There have been serious questions raised about whether Papua New Guinea is actually capable of pulling this summit off. Port Moresby is one of the most dangerous cities within APEC and Papua New Guinea its poorest country, so larger economies have been chipping in to help out, including New Zealand. We contributed $15 million. That's very specific around primarily um, security support. Papua New Guinean Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has been under fire for spending millions on a luxury fleet of 40 Maseratis for the summit. Jacinda Ardern is confident none of New Zealand's money went towards those and no, she won't be travelling in one. Uh, I will not uh, and uh, I've been advised that I'll be travelling in a Toyota Highlander I believe. Jacinda Ardern will only be on the ground in Papua New Guinea for 24 hours but it will be 24 hours rubbing shoulders with the world's most powerful and top of her agenda will be trade and security issues including climate change. To other news now, a Papua New Guinean entrepreneur who developed a power buying web application has already drawn interest from more than 20,000 subscribers in the country. Former Post Korea journalist Jive Smare taught himself how to build websites and later built the application that takes away the burden of standing in line to buy electricity. Rosemary Ambune reports. Usually the applications we use daily are not designed by Papua New Guineans, but this one is designed by a Papua New Guinean. Jive Market is a web-based application that you can use to buy power. It's not a, a mobile app as per se, it's a web application. It means that basically it's like a website, but it runs um, like an app. So what it means is if I, had a, if I built a, web, a mobile application, it would be very restricted to certain devices, uh, say Android devices, but then at certain levels, you know, it wouldn't be very universal. So I decided to go with the web app approach. So anybody can sign up, um, they just go to jivemarket.com and stuff and come in. But I try to do the onboarding myself, so they find me on Facebook and I onboard them myself, put them into the group so it's closer, so they, they all start supporting each other. I know that 20 million people or something, some ridiculous... The developer Jive Smare graduated from Divine Red University with a journalism degree. He worked with Post Korea for a while and later taught himself how to code. The journey has been long and hard. So I have a degree in journalism. I'm actually a journalist, I'm not a developer. Um, well, I am now, but I have a degree from Divine Red. Um, as of, over the years, I used I worked for Post Korea, I think, for about two years, and then I quit. And I started doing magazines and doing my own publications and so forth. And one of the 
things I was doing too was just building websites and I started off building a, uh, I, I started off to teach myself how to, myself how to build a website, I started off building my own commercial website which is called PNG Cars. It's no longer, it doesn't exist anymore. As an entrepreneur, Jive took on risk. He showed the application to PNG Power and now has more than 20,000 subscribers. Because that for me is to add more services onto the application now. And so either if they're like Digicel, I'm going to be accessing the Digicel API soon. Um, be all and Telecom don't, I'm going to build that and do it my, on my own and push that in as well. And then I'm going to go after the, uh, uh, so my bank, so I've signed up an agreement with my bank now to become, become like, uh, to get all the agents into my bank as well. Expansion is on the horizon. He also plans to add more services. Rosemary Yambune, National MTV News. A new automotive training center was launched yesterday in Port Moresby Technical College. This is another initiative by a joint partnership of Port Moresby Technical College and the Australian Pacific Technical College. This new facility cost more than 3 million kina. It was built in partnership with the Australian and PNG governments. The center will aim to improve the quality of technical education in PNG. Port Mosby Technical College offers various trade courses to young people. These courses include automotive, auto electrical and engineering trades. The college has about 120 students. With the new training center, Pontec is now looking forward to enrolling more school leavers who wish to be motor mechanics. In the past, uh, we had run down facilities. The facilities were not good. Uh, industry had to complain because we are also training apprentices for uh, uh, companies like PNG Motors, Porovo Motors, Ella Motors in the past. And it was a challenge for us as an administration. But we are grateful that uh, ABDC came and partnered with Pontec. We saw the need. Uh, we pulled down the old building. Uh, threw it away and put the state-of-the-art uh, uh, automotive training center. And now you can see that uh, we've got very good classrooms with new equipment. And I say, what I say to the uh, Papua New Guinea children is that if you want to st uh, study motor mechanic, come to Port Mosby Technical College. Meanwhile, the Australian Foreign Affairs Minister, Maurice Payne, is pleased with the increase of young women taking up the trade. And amongst the brightest aspects of the future, I'm particularly pleased to see so many young women involved in training here and to hear such positive reports of their training and engagement. Indeed, I'm told that POMTEC and APTC aim for 50% of their student population to be women. She says a centre like this is a valuable opportunity to challenge stereotypes by encouraging more women into fields previously dominated by the male students. Podivai, National MTV News. Stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, the number of people missing following the devastating California wildfires has more than doubled. At least 63 people are dead, but that number is likely to rise as U.S. authorities reveal more than 600 remain missing. The search for the missing has become a monumental task. Ute County Sheriff Corey Honey said more than 500 more names were added overnight after combing through hundreds of emergency calls that have come in for missing people. The chaos that we were dealing with uh, was extraordinary. And so now we're trying to go back and make sure that we're accounting for um, uh, all of the information. Heavenly Father, please help us. Firefighters and rescue workers were overwhelmed with 911 calls as the fire surrounded people in their homes and cars trying to escape. Elderly, needs help right now. It's not looking good for uh, get people out. Social media is filled with posts of those looking for missing friends and family members. Most fear the death toll will rise. Start throwing up some prayers. City officials say more than 30,000 alerts were sent to home and cell phones as well as text messages. The flames were matching the height of the trees. No alert was sent to Matt Masterson. He was home alone with his three-year-old daughter when flames jumped into his backyard. He ran for his life after getting this message from a 911 operator. She says, don't wait for us. Do what you can to survive. No plan will ever work 
100% when you're dealing with that much chaos. Many did make it out. 52,000 residents were evacuated, and now makeshift shelters have popped up, including this one and the parking lot of a Walmart. Do you know what's going to happen next for you? No, I do not. I do not. And that concerns you? Yeah, it does. I don't have a place to go. Theresa May is still hanging on there as British Prime Minister as the Brexit turmoil continues. She seems to have seen off a rebellion trying to unseat her for now. Theresa May pulling up in her Crown limo to sell her Brexit plan to talk back callers. I respectfully ask you to do the right thing in the national interest and stand down to allow someone from the Brexit camp to take the lead. Well, it didn't start well. The he Prime Minister the used the slot to explain to listeners directly. But it's a negotiation. Yes. And any negotiation, complex as it is, is actually a negotiation which leads to compromise. And allay fears by uncharacteristically getting personal. I'm a type 1 diabetic. I depend on insulin every day. As it happens, my insulin is produced by a company in, in uh, the European Union. It's not just the insulin that's providing a lifeline. A band of loyal supporters are fighting to keep her at number 10. She's behaved with tremendous dignity and not to say resilience uh, in this particular matter, which has been very impressive, especially close up. I want to see people getting behind the Prime Minister. This is not a time for changing our leader. Amber Rudd has just been pulled into Cabinet following yesterday's mass exodus. And there's a new Brexit secretary too, an MP called Stephen Barclay, rumoured to be the only one who wanted the job. Even strident Leave campaigner Michael Gove is on May's side. Do you have confidence in the Prime Minister, Mr Gove? I absolutely do. But there's a just as hardcore group who don't support her, and they continue to come out of the woodwork today. This MP's letter to party officials opening with... She just doesn't listen. But so far, not enough of these letters of no confidence to force a leadership vote, meaning Theresa May hangs on for another day. So William Goldman has died at the age of 87. He was most famous for his classics, The Princess Bride and Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid. Some of Hollywood's most famous words in the mouths of its biggest stars in some of its best known films. Rules in a knife fight. From Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Just follow the money. What? To all the president's men. My name is Diego Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. To the Princess Bride. Still, William Goldman never seemed to impress with himself. I don't like my writing, I should say that. I never have liked it, I don't like it. A novelist before trying his hand at screenplays. His award-winning career included two Oscars, one for Butch Cassidy, one of the few pieces of his own work he spoke well of. I've only liked two things I've ever written. I like Butch Cassidy and I like The Princess Bride. But today, after his death from colon cancer at 87, the praise was flowing. Ron Howard called him one of the greatest, most successful screenwriters ever. You murdered my misery! Eddie. Eddie. Stephen King called him both witty and talented, and Goldman's adaptation of his novel Misery, a beautiful thing. Nobody knows anything, William Goldman once said, about what made a hit. Anyone who remembers the terror he created with just three words, is it safe? Is it safe? In Marathon Man, might beg to differ. Up next, some sporting updates in Shukai Sports. Don't go away. Shukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. Community coach development is one area that can assist and upskill coaches to meet national standards. That's from the coach development officer Paul Marga. Through a program with Oceania's sports education program, coaches at community levels are taken through lessons provided by development officers. 
Since the establishment of High Performance Sports Program in 2013, the main focus of the PNG Sports Foundation and High Performance Sport was purely focused on athletes. But in order to have top performing athletes, High Performance Sports has also turned its attention into creating highly skilled coaches that are identified at community level. Uh, one of our main focuses too is uh, looking at the coaches at the, the community level. This is high performance using a program under the, it's called the OSEP, which is the Oceania Sports Education Program. Mm -hmm. The headquarters is normally based in Fiji, Suva. Mm -hmm. uh, they give us programs where we coordinate, uh, conduct these programs, we facilitate them. A program established between PNG Sports Foundation and the city of Gold Coast was the Sports Leadership Summit set up to upskill coaches and athletes to meet international standards. And one of the main, the main focus is to up, uh, upgrade coaches or aspiring young coaches or elite coaches or national coaches who are att attached to various sporting uh, codes here in Papua New Guinea to prepare them for the up and coming 2019 Pacific Games which is going to be held in July in Samoa. High Performance Sport with its many programs including assisting coaches at community level to better understand their sport, the difference between a coach and an athlete and how both parties can better understand each other's roles during and before sporting events. Strength and conditioning coach Leo Loma says being a coach at High Performance Center is a real privilege. Me as a coach or a leader you have to always think about others. So others, they can be your athletes, they can be other people, can be a family. And with others, you have to be influential. So as a coach, as you think of others, you have to be influential. How to influence others to be better people. He says not only can one teach training techniques, but also to get to understand the pain and pressure athletes go through in terms of preparing for big sporting events. Always working with the athletes, it's always fun. I would say for my side, because I like um, interacting, having fun with my athletes, not necessarily always being um, serious and all that in our training. But at least training, yes, also having fun, we also get results from that. Individual coaches at community levels are encouraged to approach high performance sports PNG for advice or assistance with their sporting events or training programs in their communities. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. The University Sports Day is scheduled to take place next week. Some of the sporting events taking place are Rugby Touch, AFL and Soccer. Talent identification officials will also be scouting potential athletes for further training. In its third year, University Sport is a platform used by High Performance Sport PNG to identify talented sportsmen and women and to give them an opportunity to not only focus on studies but also to socialize and engage in sporting activities and at the same time pick out potential individuals that are capable of representing PNG at regional and international sporting events. There's another international day of University Sports that is happening on the 17th of November but it falls on the week of APEC which we deferred it to next week so the sports that will be taking part is soccer, AFL, rugby touch yeah so it's like a day that all universities come together and celebrate. The event catered to engage tertiary students will see participants play AFL, touch footy and soccer. While the event is still new to the country, High Performance Sports is hoping that more and more students with sporting talents will come out and showcase their sporting skills at this year's University Sports Day. So we have UPNG, IEA, Pombi School, TAFE, yeah. But we'd like to have like competitions, like regular competitions to get students involved in sports, like for them, yeah. Lay will also celebrate University Sports Day where tertiary students in Lay will participate. Jackie says the event in the past two years has identified many new talents that are now part of the national teams and representing PNG at both regional and international sporting competitions. Most students they think that they can't balance sports and education but it is manageable where they can balance most and it's been proven that it's been proven that sports and um, education is like it's a success where they 
it encourage them more on their goals and all that, yeah. High Performance Sports PNG is hoping this year's event will identify potential new talents that can also one day represent PNG in any international events. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports will continue with more after the break. Stay tuned. <laughs> Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. The All Blacks have identified their defence line-out as the key to stopping Ireland tomorrow morning. It is the biggest test of the season. There's one strength of Ireland's that Kieran Reid doesn't want dominating at Aviva Stadium. The home side usually banks on having the majority of possession so it can control the game's tempo. In terms of how they hold on to the ball, the best probably in uh, T1 nations in the world. The All Blacks will use their biggest assets to try to stop that, lineouts and scrums. I have a crack at them at source, um, so set piece is going to be vital. It certainly worked last week against England, when New Zealand stole four lineouts in the second half, and they'll be lifted by the fact Ireland lost three throws against Argentina. Their hooker and captain Rory Best doesn't sound overly confident. I hold myself to a counter in the line-out, so regardless, and we looked through it and there were a few that they couldn't have been thrown any better and we still lost, but you still feel those. So you can be sure line-out forwards Brody Retallick, Sam Whitelock and Kieran Reid will have a crack. So we just pride ourselves on getting in the air, hopefully trying to disrupt as much as we can. Um, so we'll try to do that again. It's just about reading cues and, and trying to pick where they go. Ireland might also want to hold on to the ball because kicking it out means the All Blacks can use their attacking line out and they're very wary of that. You know, you see with the stats the New Zealand have, you know, tries scored off their line out. Um, it's by far the highest area that they've scored tries from, so it's, uh, it's an area we'll focus on. When the All Blacks do get the ball, one solution to stopping Ireland dominating possession is playing them at their own game. You know, what we do with the ball ourselves will be important. Um, so we're going to kick it, we've got to kick it well, make sure we get a chance to get it back and do a wee bit of suffocating ourselves. With the two top ranked teams promising ball in hand, the battle to be the world's best shouldn't be a kick fest. And to cricket, the Black Caps begin just the second day of their test summer and they're already in salvage mode. After electing to bat against Pakistan, New Zealand were dismissed for 153, the lowest first innings ever recorded on the Abu Dhabi circuit. ...is back, but after a batting capitulation, New Zealand might be wishing it wasn't. Ah! Oh, big shot, given, first ball! Seven wickets falling for just 42 runs, the Black Caps rolled for 153, their worst first innings performance in almost six years. Ah! Ah! Big appeal, given! Only once has a team lost while batting first in Abu Dhabi. But from ball one, the Kiwis failed to capitalise on prime conditions. Openers Jeet Raval and Tom Latham offering little resistance. It's the softest, Mr Lafiz takes the catch. There was a short period of positivity. Kane Williamson and Henry Nichols building a platform of respectability. After struggling at 39 for three, the pair added 72 runs. And there's the 50 partnership. Williamson was in fine touch, crafting a classy 63 with some stellar footwork. Another half century to uh, the skipper, 27th half century. But Pakistan were effective in building pressure, especially through Muhammad Abbas, and when Nichols fell on 28 and Williamson soon after, the fight back ended. Uh, what a breakthrough, yeah. Time to celebrate. The odd new ball pairing of Colin de Gronholm and Trent Bold gave the Black Caps hope at stumps. So things happening for New Zealand, the smile is back. Smiles that will only remain if the Kiwis can produce something special when day two starts shortly. And then Shukai Sports, the weather details when we come back. Shukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG.
Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, fine although cloudy in Port Moresby, mostly fine in Daru, mostly cloudy in Kerama, mostly fine in Alatau as well, and a thundery showers in Popondita with a top temperature of 30 degrees. In the Mamasi region, a shower or two in Leh, showers and rain in Wau, rain showers in Wiwek and Vanimo, and Medang, showers and thunderstorms. In the New Guinea Islands region, rain showers in Lorengal, Cavian, Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe and cloudy also with some showers in Buka. And in the Highlands region, rain showers in Mount Hagen, fog and rain in Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama to Yul Island to Hood Point and to Samurai Island with waters of Manus and its western group of islands including waters of New Island to east and west New Britain to Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 metres. Waters of Eastern and Western Milne Islands with waters of Samare Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen, including waters of Finchhafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits to Siasi Islands to Long Island and with waters of West New Britain, seas of 1 to 2 metres. Waters of Long Island to Medang to Bogia to Wiwak to Aitape and Vanimo to Northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 0.5 to 1 metre. Looking at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas slide with southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas slide to moderate with southeast winds of 10 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slide to moderate with southeast to southwest winds at 10 to 20 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slide with south to southwest winds at 15 to 20 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And before we go, here's a recap of tonight's main stories. PNG embraces China's partnership as U.S. Vice President wants of debt diplomacy. U.S. announces intention to support naval base construction in Manus and Mahathir Mohamed shares Malaysian digital experience. And that ends National MTV News this Saturday, the 17th of November 2018. From the news team, pleasant viewing and good night.